So, welcome to Annual Meeting Sunday. This is a big day in the church, or I always think it's a big day. It's when we celebrate our ownership of this congregation. After church, we will have our annual meeting where we will vote on the budget and the slate of officers and a few other things as well, most likely. And, um, you know, we'll hear a little bit about how our congregation has done in this remarkably unusual year. Um, I do invite you to attend that. I encourage you to. Those of you who are watching who are members, um, we'd love to see you so you can vote on these things. This is your church too. And those of you who are not and might be curious about annual meeting, I know it's, it's a meeting, feel free to pop in. If not, um, that's fine. Um, and if you're curious about how to become a member, please get in touch with the church so you can be encouraged to attend annual meeting next year. Um, I think that's all that I have to say right now. Um, we will be talking a little bit about the spirit of our congregation, about relationships, and um, in the sermon at the end, there's a very specific ask because we will be finding ways to talk with each other about our relationships with each other, but also really with the church itself. So let's think about our relationship with the church um, in a moment of silence. Blessed be. join me in the recitation of our covenant. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. reading this morning comes from the, the third chapter of the book of Revelation. It reads, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this, The Amen, the witness, faithful and true, the source of God's creation, says this, I know your deeds. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. 
how I wish you were one or the other, hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You keep saying I am so rich and secure that I want for nothing. Little do you realize how wretched you are, how pitiable and poor, how blind and naked. Here I stand, knocking at the door. If any hear me, calling and open the door, I will enter the house and have supper with them. And a second reading. This one from Susan Beaumont's book, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. From the chapter, Tending the Soul of the Institution. In my consulting work with congregations, I have encountered a divine essence at work in the life of the institution. Something that longs to express itself in moments of direction setting and decision making. For many years, I resisted using soul language to describe this essence. Soul language felt overused and at times misused. I feared that it was theologically incorrect to speak of an organization as having a soul. That soul language could only apply to the human experience. So I adopted many other labels to describe the divine essence to which I had been witness. I talked about the movement of the spirit through the organization. I described it as a distinct part of the organizational culture, the spirituality of the people, or the collective voice of the leadership body. In the end, each of these labels failed me. None of these constructs adequately describe the essence. And none of these labels help me approach the essence as an agent of guidance. So by default, I find myself returning to the notion that an institution has a soul. And I find companionship in others who have named the same. Therein ends this morning's reading. And please now would you join me in a time of spoken and silent prayer, beginning by just settling our bodies, quieting our minds, perhaps closing the eyes or softening the gaze turning that gaze inward. In silence, let us lift up our prayers for all of those in need of prayer this morning. Holy One, you who we call by so many names, yet is beyond all naming, help us to be open to your presence this morning, across distance and across time. 
Help us to be open to this sense of love, the sense of connectedness we feel between each other, to the soul that is inside of us, inside of our institutions, our church, our communities. For for this soul, for this connectedness, for this love, we give you thanks. We are humbled this morning by the ways in which community is the foundation of our lives. The ways in which we are inextricably bound up with one another in ways that challenge us, in ways that lift us up. For we know that our joy is amplified when it is shared and that our sorrows are a much lighter burden to bear when we hold them together. So God, we give you thanks on this morning for the gift that is this community. May you stir in our hearts unrest so that we might pick up the work that is ours to do, so that we might recommit to this community, to one another, to the call to love. Amen. And now would you please join me in reciting the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples and has been recited in communities of faith for so many years. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. When we gather for annual meeting, we have a lot of other things on our minds, as we often do, as we often do when we come to church or go to other meetings. Today, for example, there are plans to either watch or ignore the Super Bowl, and there are personal concerns and interests for each of us, business and passions that we set aside today for talk about budget and programming and for looking back at what we have accomplished as a church, as a church community, and looking forward toward ways to improve the coming year. Now, I actually always enjoy annual meeting. I get to talk a little bit 
But really, at the meeting, I am mostly a witness. A witness to people of sincere intent doing the work of being together. The work that leads to things like pub theology, ski trips, confirmation, service projects, and of course, worship too. In fact, every bit of annual meeting, even the Super Bowl squares, has to do with the life of a people. A people, though we may not think of ourselves that way very often. A people finding a way, steering toward the horizon and into the unknown. So, I love annual meetings, and I hope you do too. Annual meeting sermons, on the other hand, can be difficult. The goal on Sunday mornings is to talk about the big picture. That's our goal every Sunday morning. And today, while the big picture is still the goal here at worship, our time after will be spent in details, important details, holy, sacred details, but still the details. But the big picture needs its time. And that's what we're doing right now. Because what we are building at Elliott Church is something greater than the sum of its parts. Bigger than us, than our money and our time. Instead, it has its own soul, its own spirit, its own personality, and its own separate life from each of us. That is what we are building today. And as we progress through this meeting, one of the things we should be aware of is the presence of this spirit, the spirit of the church and its influence. Susan Beaumont in our reading today says that she finds herself returning to a notion that an institution has a soul that an institution has a soul. And I have to say that after two decades of parish ministry, I agree with her. The Elliott Church has belonged to many people since its founding in 1828, and yet it has retained a certain personality, one that we have contributed to, but one that also challenges and sometimes confounds us. When we look at our history, the history of the church, and our individual history in relationship with that church, there is something within it that deserves to be called a soul. Now, John of Patmos in the book of Revelations uses a different word for the same thing. <clears throat> He uses a different word for the same thing. When he chooses to appeal to certain congregations, not by addressing the people or the leaders or the clergy, but by addressing each congregation's angel. To the angel of the church in Laodicea or Philadelphia or Smyrna, he says, and it is clear in his address that each angel, just like each congregation, is different. Now, I chose Laodicea for our reading today because the risk of our time and place, and not just for us, but for many liberal and progressive congregations, is similar to their struggle. I know that you are neither hot nor cold, he says. How I wish you were either hot or cold. Here he is concerned about a lack of conviction, of energy, and concerned with the attraction of feeling secure and wanting for nothing, in the words of the Bible, in a time when the world outside its doors 
It's anything, was anything, but secure. Now, we live in a similar time, don't we? And the angel of the Elliot Church, along with all of us, faces a moment of decision. Are we hot or are we cold? Or are we lukewarm, just going along to get along without knowing who we actually are? What does this church stand for, if anything? And do we, each of us, do we stand for the same thing as the angel of the church? Are we willing to be in relationship with this spirit? Now, in our hearts, we know about this moment. We talk about it every week about how we have found ways to navigate the difficulties that have been presented to us lately. But we have done so in the moment, addressing the problems as they come up and finding creative solutions. And this year, the one that starts today, this year will be different. No matter what happens with the virus or virus says, and with our return to in-person worship, and we know, in our hearts, we know that we cannot be entirely reactive to the forces arrayed against us anymore. We need to look toward the future, as murky as that future is. Now, let's be clear. Every house of worship in the world has been in survival mode for the last 12 months. Every house of worship in the world has been in survival mode for the last 12 months, extending themselves in numerous ways. And this year, some of those houses of worship, some of those faith communities will close their doors, having been exhausted of energy and resources. And others, probably maybe even most, will become lukewarm, of no use to anybody, paying their bills and wasting people's time. But some communities of faith some houses of worship, some congregations will thrive in whatever it is that comes next. And each congregation in that group, the group we want to be in, will know its own soul. It will be in relationship with its spirit, its angel, will understand the direction of its own passion. So if we really do want to be in the group that thrives. We need to let go of the edge of the pool. We need to stop just surviving and instead look inward to understand what drives this community, to ask what kind of relationship we each want to have with it. And then, then informed by this relationship, then make choices for the future that reflect the direction we wish to go as a congregation. As a congregation. Now there are a lot of ways we can do this. But before we even come up with a plan, the first thing is that relationship. The way we understand the soul of this church so that we can plan for our future is to talk and to listen. It is to share a bit of our own souls. That's what a relationship is. And to share our own personal relationships with this institution. And so we ask, why do we come here? You could be born and raised in this church, or you could be here on the first 
day ever for you, worshiping with us. You could live in Wellesley, or Natick, or Framingham, or Boston, or Maine, or Georgia, or California. But for whatever reason, you made a choice to bring your soul here today. So starting tomorrow, starting tomorrow, Tara and I will be sending out invitations for you to participate in a small group, to talk and to listen. Yes, there's a little bit of detail, a little bit of business in this sermon. And the subject of these groups is the connection between our souls, our souls, and the soul of this institution. We will not be talking about program when we invite you to these groups or about committees. We won't be talking about plans for membership retention or recruitment. The only subject will be what calls us to this community and what does this community, this institution call us to do in the coming year. Like I said, we'll be sending out an email email invitations for small groups of no more than six people per group. And right now those groups will occur over Zoom, so they should be relatively easy to schedule and attend, hopefully. And if you don't get an invitation tomorrow or the next day, and you're fired up to be in a group, don't wait. Don't wait to hear from us. Get in touch. We need your vision. We need your passion. Because the old way is now gone, and what comes next depends on all of us and on the church that we love. Now, one of the other traditions we have around our annual meeting, and maybe it's because it's tied to Super Bowl Sunday, I'm not sure, is that we preface this annual meeting by taking communion, by the ritual act of being together as a community of doubt and of faith, of fear and of hope. So let us prepare ourselves for that moment and consider the angel of our church, the soul of our congregation. blessed be. And now it is time for communion, so let us take a moment to center ourselves. Let us come together to celebrate the story of Jesus, to connect to that story and to each other through the sharing of bread and wine. These simple things have been through the ages a sign of unity, a source of strength, and a witness to the power of sacrificial love. So let us now join again in silence for our private prayers of confession. And now let us hear these words from the 36th Psalm. Your steadfast love, O God, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O God. How precious is your steadfast love, O God, All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. 
They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on us, or the hand of the wicked drive us away. When the hour had come, Jesus took a place at the table with the apostles, and Jesus said to them, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I will not eat it again until everything is fulfilled in the reign of God. Then taking a cup of wine, Jesus gave thanks and said, take this and share it among you. I tell you, I will not drink wine from now on until the reign of of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat this bread in remembrance of Jesus and of those who are near and dear to us. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of Jesus and of those who have been near and dear to us. Our closing words for communion are from Jacob Trapp. Simply to be and to let things be as they speak, wordlessly from the mystery of what they are. Simply to say a silent yes to the hillside flowers, to the trees we walk under. To pass from one person to another, a morsel of bread, an answering yes. This is the simplest and quietest of all the sacraments. Amen. Our benediction today is from Barbara Peskin. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. 
because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Amen and blessed be. This concludes this part of our service. I hope to see you all at annual meeting. And if not, I hope you have a blessed Sabbath day.